Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Chronicles of a Guna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simu. Yes, I'm back in the booth. Um, it looks like I'm working in a call center with the headset and all the rest of it. Before you make the jokes, I thought I'd make them first. Uh, big hello to everybody watching us on YouTube and a big hello to everybody that will be listening to this on audio. If you're listening to this on audio, you probably haven't got the, the slightest idea of what I'm talking about um, and why I'm making that joke. But if you're watching on YouTube, you'll get it, I suppose. I uh, hope everybody's good. hope everybody's well. hope everybody's woken up after another dreadful, dire, dismal, boring England uh, performance last night. Uh, a nil-nil draw with Slovenia. Um, enough for England to win the group still. And actually, when you look at how things panned out during the day, when France, of course, dropped points against Poland, meaning that they didn't win their group, Austria did. Actually, you could make the case and you could make the argument that this has worked out really well for England, who haven't played anywhere near their best yet, given that the, the talent that Gareth Southgate has at his disposal, who have stuttered through the group stage, you have to say, but have booked their place in the round of 16 and are now on a significantly weaker side of the draw, giving them a great chance of going all the way to Berlin. Well, We'll see how that pans out for Gareth Southgate's side. But it is going to be a brief episode today. I know they've been quite brief over the course of this week. It's a really, really busy, crazy week for me. And the reason for that is because I am heading out to Germany on Friday morning to cover the remainder of the European Championships. Now, I will be bringing you guys a bit of content every single day. Fingers crossed, as long as nothing goes majorly wrong. But they are going to be sort of 15, 20 minute episodes, nice, compact editions of the podcast, just because I'm going to be on the road a lot. I'm going to be taking trains from one side of the country to the other. Not exactly sure what the plan looks like in full just yet as well, because it depends on the draw, the games, the accreditations, etc., etc. So, um, yeah. I'm going to be keeping you guys informed with all things Arsenal. I'll, I'll, of course, be staying across it myself. We'll bring you some Euros content on the channel as well, seeing as I'll be there. But that's why this podcast today is going to be a little bit shorter, just because I've got a million and one things still to sort out. Um, broke the news to the wife that I'll be going for around about two and a half weeks. Uh, she knew I was going. Um I was just very vague when talking about the dates. And she went, what? Two and a half weeks? What am I going to do uh, without you and the kids for two and a half weeks? Um, but it's work. It's got to be done. So, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I was going to say that I'm looking forward to seeing how England get on in the competition. But watching them over the first three games, I actually kind of quietly prefer to go to different games or to be across different games. But we'll see. You know, I'm hoping uh, that it all works out the way I want it to. But obviously, uh, you never know with these things, right? So you got to um, you, you got to just take it as it comes. But there's been loads of focus on the England uh, performances. There's been loads of focus on Gareth Southgate, the way he's picked the team, the lack of balance. And one of the solutions that's been put forward is what I want to discuss on this episode today. And it was a solution, a potential solution that was put forward by former Arsenal man, Arsenal legend, Arsenal hero, Ian Wright, which has been met with so much criticism online. I've got to be honest, I can't believe the reaction to this. Now, I've been on multiple platforms over the last week or so talking about England, how they can improve things, how they can do better. And one of the things I suggested, because I'm against dropping Bukayo Saka from the team, which some people are suggesting. I'm against dropping Phil Foden from the team, which some are suggesting, because I think he's a really, really good player. I think they're England's two best players. I really, really do. I think they're up there among England's two best players. And to take them out of the team, even if it does give you a bit of balance, I think is more counterproductive than productive. So my suggestion was to put Bukayo Saka out onto the left wing. Let him provide the natural width. Let him provide... Um, you know, the, the the wing play that I think England are missing on that left-hand side. And if you want to bring in Cole Palmer on the right, who looked pretty good when he came on, but not much more than that, I have to say. Uh, you want to do that on the right-hand side, do that. Or you want to use Foden on the right-hand side because he feels more comfortable coming in from there. Then you can do that too. My suggestion was to use Bukayo Saka as a left-winger because he's got that ability 
with his left foot to take people on on the outside and get to the byline and provide the kind of service that we all know Bukayo Saka can. We also know that he's one of the few players in this England team that can run beyond Kane. That's another thing people have been moaning about. Not enough runners beyond the centre forward. Well, Bukayo Saka can do that. And if you're slipping him in on his stronger side, I know you can make the case that if you slip him in on the right, he comes in on his stronger left foot anyway. But I just think because he's a left-sided player and because he can give you the width that Phil Foden can't, despite also being left-footed, that that might be the way to go. That might be a slight tweak that you can make that improves the balance of the team. Ian Wright said on the ITV coverage last night that he thinks that there's a, uh, you know, there's a there's a real case actually for moving Bukayo Saka into left back and putting Cole Palmer in on the right flank. And the reason he said that is because England are playing currently with Kieran Trippier at left back. He isn't able to get forward and support the attack in the way that fullbacks do uh, in 2024. He's on his wrong side. If he does make that overlapping run, he's always at some point going to have to check back onto his stronger right foot in order to produce the level of service that we know Kieran Trippier can. And so Ian Wright, I think, was thinking out loud. And and, and obviously, Bukayo Saka has played at left back for Arsenal in the past. When he first broke into the team, it was at left back. He was coming into cover. Then he moved into a slightly more advanced position on that left hand side before eventually becoming the right winger that he is today. Yeah, right wing is his best position, but sometimes people need to do a job for the team. And I understand where Ian Wright's coming from in that having a player with the engine to get up and down that left hand side who is probably more competent defensively than most other wingers. And you know, given the selflessness that Bukayo Saka has shown throughout his career, that actually could be a good thing. And imagine a world where Bukayo Saka is overlapping Phil Foden. Imagine how that might work. That could be a really, really nice dynamic. So look, it's not what I would do and I don't necessarily agree with it, but I can't believe the criticism that Ian Wright has faced. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's insane because it's not that outside of the box in terms of as an idea. It's not, again, what I would do, but it's not that wild. It's not that crazy. I've been a bit annoyed, really, with how certain individuals in this England team have sort of become scapegoats and others have got away scot-free. Uh, that's really been a frustration of mine. I think the, the heat and the criticism that Declan Rice has taken, for example, has been over the top. I'll be the first person to say that I don't think he's the greatest ball progressor. And that I think he could do that better. And that I think that not having the right partner next to him has actually shone a light on the fact that he's not as good at doing that as your Jorginho's, as your Rodri's, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that Trent Alexander-Arnold got a lot of flack the other day. I was sort of accused of making him uh, the scapegoat, which is absolutely not what I was doing. I was just saying that he's not a midfielder. And so how can you get a right back to develop all of a midfielder's habits in the space of a handful of games. It's just not viable. It just doesn't work. And so I said that you needed to go with a more conventional midfielder next to him. Having thought about it, having thought long and hard about it in the build-up to the Slovenia game, I settled on the idea that actually Kobe Mainu would be the best option because he can help you out defensively, as we've seen him do for Eric Ten Hag's Manchester United, particularly in that FA Cup final against Manchester City. But we've also seen Kobe Mainu get on the ball, dictate the tempo, um, combine with people, make moves into the right areas and be able to break lines with one or two passes. And that is exactly when I think about what this England side are lacking, what they've been missing. So Kobe Mainu felt like the best option to me. Some had suggested Adam Wharton. Some had said that, well, if Mainu can do it, then Wharton can. And I'm not completely against that either. I know that they're not mega experienced. I know that in Walton's case, I think there's a reservation from people because he plays for Crystal Palace, which is probably a little bit unfair as well. I always think, right, that it's about profiles. It's about creating the best possible balance. And that doesn't always mean selecting the best possible individuals. Is there a bit of Gareth Southgate looking at certain individuals and thinking, well, you're just too good in terms of your reputation and me dropping you is only going to bring criticism. So rather than actually being bold and brave in my decisions and doing that, instead, I'm going to try and shoehorn you all in so that you're all in the team. So nobody's complaining. Nobody's unhappy within the camp that is. And we'll just try and find a way to make it work. 
Rice has been one that's been heavily criticised. And I, I was critical of, of some of his play against Denmark, admittedly, but not to the point where I'm sitting there saying, what actually is Declan Rice all about? And is he actually a good midfield player? Which is some of the stuff I've seen written and actually published by reputable outlets over the last uh, sort of 24 hours. It's absolute madness. Then there's Bukayo Saka, who I think has been one of the best of a really bad bunch of England players at this tournament. I think when England have looked like they're going to make something happen, he's always been involved in it in some way, shape or form. I think there's an over-reliance on Bukayo Saka because, as we've discussed, England don't really have a functional left side. But with that over-reliance comes extra attention from the opposition, which makes Bukayo Saka's life a lot harder. I mean, he's Bukayo Saka, so he's going to get attention anyway. Teams are going to set out to stifle him anyway. But given the lack of a functional left side, that has been, uh, you know, even more. And that is a difficult thing for a player to find a way through. Cole Palmer came on on, what, 70-odd minutes after Bukayo Saka had run the fullback into the ground, after Bukayo Saka had got him booked, I think, as well, and did okay. Like, he looked lively, he looked sharp. But if you flip the roles around, if Cole Palmer started the game, I guarantee you he probably wouldn't have done any more than what Bukayo Saka was able to do during the time he was on the pitch. I think sometimes a player can come on and do look like they're doing quite well. And I'm not saying Cole Palmer was bad. I'm just saying he wasn't as good as people made him out to be. But actually, the game state allows them to flourish. The game state allows them to show something more. You're talking about the dying stages of a game in which Slovenia have been camped behind the ball, desperately trying to shut spaces, desperately trying to shut gaps. Not just physically tiring, but that's mentally tiring too. And you run the guy ragged. You run him down into the ground. You bring on a fresh pair of legs. And all of a sudden, that player's impact is amplified by the game state. And I think that's exactly what's happened with Cole Palmer. Anthony Gordon came on and everybody was saying that, well, he has to start in the next game. Why? Because he played five minutes. Because he took someone on and ran the ball out of play. And again, this is not being a critic of Anthony Gordon. It's just everybody's so annoyed, so downbeat, so frustrated, and so desperate to try and come up with a solution or what Gareth Southgate's doing wrong, that they're being super reactive. Anthony Gordon didn't have enough minutes on the pitch to prove yesterday that he should start in the next game. Cole Palmer, because of what I've just discussed, I don't think has done enough to say he's definitely 100% got a categorically start in the round of 16 game. I think the only person that did, and that's because he had far greater time on the pitch, of course, is Kobe Minor. He's the one that Gareth Southgate has to be starting in the next round of games. And I wonder if starting him from the very off is actually going to bring a lot more out of your Foden's, out of your Sackers, maybe out of your Jude Bellingham's, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, by the way, in which case you won't need to shuffle the pack that much. On Jude Bellingham, just before I go, this is really, really important. Against Serbia, he was obviously the man that made the difference. It was his goal that handed England the three points, which essentially... Um, you know, put one foot for the three Lions into the next round. We discussed it the day after the game and he also got back and defended really well and supported really well and put in a really, really good shift. And in a bad performance, which it was again, uh, Jude Bellingham was one of the bright stars. He came across ultra confident and people were looking at him and thinking, my God, I thought he came across as a little bit arrogant. I didn't like the way he was going around the pitch, barging into people for no reason, trying to kind of create these moments of fuel and fire that he could uh, maybe sort of get a second wind of energy from, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't really like all of that. We talked about it again um, straight after that game. But there's no getting away from the fact that against Denmark and against Slovenia, he's been completely and utterly anonymous. And my big frustration is not why isn't everybody criticising Jude Bellingham? Because I'm not someone that looks at this England team and thinks it's this individual's fault or it's that individual's fault. I think as a collective, there's no balance. I think the lack of balance means a lack of cohesion. I think the, the fact that these players don't play together week in, week out um, is by default, going to lower the standard. And I think that's the same of all national teams. There are very few national teams that look like club teams. The one national team in this competition so far that has resembled the club team 
is Austria. And that's why I think everybody's been so impressed with them. A group of players that have all come through the Red Bull model that are now being coached by the guy that built the Red Bull model in Ralph Ragnick. It's been easier for him, I think, to get his ideas across and have those players buy into them because they're already a part of their habits. They're already a part of what they do and have done on a weekly basis for a long, long time. I'm not someone that looks at any one individual in this England team and says, you're the reason that England aren't performing. As a collective, they've got to do better. They've got to find a way of performing at a much, much higher level. But it does drive me insane that the likes of Jude Bellingham have managed to escape all forms of criticism, whilst Harry Kane, who's been there and done it for England for years, whilst Bukayo Saka, who's been a big part of this England team in recent times. I think he was England Player of the Year, two years running. Um, Phil Foden, who's the PFA Player of the Year. It does annoy me that those guys are being singled out, Declan Rice too, after every bad England performance. And Jude Bellingham, who's strolling around in between the midfield and the forward line, not getting close enough to combine with Harry Kane, not really making runs beyond Harry Kane anywhere near enough, but also failing at the moment to drop into those deeper holes and support the midfield in getting a real hold of the game and, and going searching for the ball. It annoys me that he escapes all forms of criticism. I can't understand why that is. Again, it's nothing personal to Jude Bellingham. It's just people are not fair in their analysis. The tribalism kicks in. Teams, uh, supporters obviously start to defend their own place. Every Chelsea fan will tell you that Bukayo Saka should be dropped and Cole Palmer should play. Every Arsenal fan will tell you that Bukayo Saka um, should be playing ahead of Cole Palmer. City fans will tell you Foden should play as the 10. You know, others will tell you that Bellingham should play as a 10. We've all divided ourselves into these different camps. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's what we've got now. And Guillaume Balague put out a really, really interesting uh, post on X earlier today, which I think is true to a certain point, because I, I do think that, yes, England have been bad. And I understand why everybody's annoyed and finding it quite difficult to process but at the end of the day, England are through as group winners and are on the favoured side of the draw. So if England can improve, there's no reason why they can't go very far in this tournament. There's no need to be so doom and gloom. But here's what he said. Do you know what? Can I? Sh I what I'll do is I'll share this on the screen. Hold on. Um, so that you guys can read it as well, because I think this is really, uh, really interesting. And actually, um, from Guillaume Balaguer, actually quite telling as well. Um, in terms of how the reaction to these England results is is perhaps perceived uh, by others outside of um, England and, and beyond. Let me share this with you now. Uh, so this is what Guillaume Balaguer said. He said, an alternative view on what is wrong with England. This is what he's offering. He says it has to do with the balance of the team and the trust on the names instead of the role fillers. But what I will say next too, he thinks, and he says, you, meaning the England fans, are all to blame. He says, there is no risk. Passes are predictable. Nobody does anything special or different because they are scared. Nobody wants to be the player that gets abused on social media or the one blamed for failure. You have seen through the years what happens to the scapegoats. Fear takes risk away, which takes confidence away which makes the team easy to defend against and lacking in creativity. This has been going on for decades. The closer success is likely or the more is demanded, the more that pressure you all put the team under to win, as if there was a divine right to it for England to win, makes that fear prominent. No other national team gets this toxic pressure to win, I don't think. Now, that's a Spaniard who is familiar with Spanish football culture, the way that they deal with their national team, the way that they report on the national team, criticise or praise. I know they've had lots of reasons to praise them in recent history, but that's someone who's come into the English culture and is looking around and thinking, what on earth is going on? Like, yes, England haven't been performing well and people can say they've not been performing well. I think that's absolutely fine. I think people are well within their rights to do that. But at the same time, there's a there's a line where criticism and constructive criticism becomes overreaction and hysteria. And that overreaction and hysteria does apply pressure on the players. And people will say they're professional footballers. They should be blocking it out. They are blocking it out. It's not getting to them one bit. Look at some of the interviews. 
Look at some of the press conferences that the likes of Harry Kane and Declan Rice have had to give in the last few days. Carl Walker, too, having to constantly remind people of England's position in the group. That says to you that it is getting to them. And maybe Guillaume Balaguer has a point. Maybe if the country were a little bit more behind them, if the country were a little bit less, um, you know, angry in the way that they reflect on England games, the mood might change, things might be better, and perhaps the fear that is, as Guillaume Balaguer really smartly puts it, taking the risk and the confidence away from their game, maybe that changes things and maybe that changes the dynamic. Let me know what you think on that. Um, thank you for listening to today's episode. I know it's an Arsenal podcast. We did go England heavy after that really bad display. Uh, let me know what you think on Ian Wright's suggestion. Could Bukayo Saka be a viable option for England at left back? I've seen some Arsenal fans online suggesting that by saying that on television, Ian Wright has betrayed Bukayo Saka. I'm not going to say I agree with that. That feels a little bit extreme. It kind of plays into what we were just talking about. But let me know your thoughts. Leave a like on the video if you haven't done so already. Subscribe to the channel if your brand spanking you. And we'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye.